Good evening, everybody, and welcome along to The World Tonight. You join us on the 8th of February 2024 at uh, 22.38 of the clock in terms of the hours set by Greenwich itself. And we are in, of course, momentous territory. Uh, given that the American federal government has chosen this precise day to admit, however, um, shall we say, uh, casually, that uh, Biden is demented. And, uh, <laughs> and they have done so in, uh, in the most uh, underhanded way possible. Uh, they've used it as a uh, defense against a potential um, indictment. So we'll get to that in just a moment, because uh, before we get into this subject tonight, which is, of course, on the necessity of theory, um, it's uh, there's a couple of things that I want to cover. And, uh, well, of course, we've got to do the customary greetings to those in the chat. So let's see where we are. We've got quite an active chat already this evening. So we've got hello, hi. Uh, Tim Gray, Movie Maker Joe, who apparently watched the live stream via Rumble through a VPN. Okay, well, glad to see that picky people are finding use for the other platforms. Hello to Lisa, Rob A, Mike Martinez, greetings to you. Uh, Meta Theory is always welcomed. Okay, well, hope, hope to provide you with what you were looking for there. Albert Roundtree, good evening to you. Cobra Commander says, met a self-proclaimed market socialist at the grocery store. Uh, they came up to me because I was wearing a hammer and sickle t-shirt and talked to me for a while. I told them, oh, I'm a tanky, but I'm super nice. They said, I'm actually a little shocked you call yourself at that, and I can tell. Well, um, market socialist. By the way, there's no such thing. Um, there's um, dengists, uh, but uh, their socialism is, uh, well... <laughs> we'll get to that when we get to the China episodes, shall we say. Uh, right. Let's see. Good evening to Martin and Adam Marks. Yu Wan, who says, Hello to Alex and all comrades from Arizona, home of Charles Keating, Evan Meckham, and one of the states funding the Gaza genocide. Well... We've all got dubious claims to fame like that. Uh, Charles Keating, if you don't recall, was uh, one of the men, one of the men behind the late 1980s uh, savings and loan scandal, along with the late and unlamented Senator John McCain, uh, a, a legendary rat and a cheat, both of them. That is, Tim Gray says. A question: Did the Corbyn project do more harm than good for the left in the UK? It saved the Labour Party from death and gave false hope to many that change could happen through capitalist democracy. Interesting question. Um, in terms of the effects of it, I would say that the Corbyn project succeeded in one particular area, uh, and but not in the way that it thought that it would. It succeeded in actually demonstrating, finally, that uh, the long hopes of not just the Labour Party left, but also most of the Trotskyites and most of the so-called radicals that floated around the Labour Party and in the trade unions, that there would be one day, will, that one day would come where a true socialist would have full control of the Labour Party, he would have a mass membership behind him, he would have waves and waves of uh, hundreds of thousands of people who are enthusiastic about him and would be ready to go out there and fight. And this all happened. They had it all right there. And what happened? It was all over in four years. And they lost in 2017 an election that they should have won, by the way, um, they lost that, and I don't care if they want to cry and say it was internal sabotage. They lost it because they were fucking useless, and they were fucking useless because their politics are uh, fundamentally based on um, a totally outdated um, system, which is, of course, their system is capitalism, and based on the idea that they could recreate a specific period in British history based on a class compromise that was rooted in the existence of the Soviet Union at its height and at its uh, most revolutionary. 
and at its most threatening towards the British ruling class in terms of the example that it provided. The um, people who ran the Corbyn project were all anti-communists who had no conception as to why those concessions were given or indeed why the Labour Party was allowed and encouraged, in fact, to carry out those concessions or indeed why the Labour Party uh, was relentlessly pro-capitalist and never offered any single reforms after 1951. So they got everything that they wanted and perhaps it is one of those curses uh, inflicted by an amused god to give a man exactly what he wants because they received exactly what they wanted and they were destroyed because what they were trying to do was fundamentally impossible. And I could go on at great length about that but we don't have time. So in the end, to answer Tim's question, it's a positive thing because it actually showed, it dispelled a myth that, would, that had ex has existed for a century in Britain, or at least maybe not a century, maybe 70 odd years, that if only there would be a moment when an, uh, a serious left winger got, got to the top of the Labour Party and got to implement a East programme. Well, we had that and the serious left winger imploded and the whole project collapsed in itself. And all the different contradictions that uh, Marxist-Leninists always said were there in the Labour Party were laid bare completely. And the total collapse of that project and its contemptible failure is in the end going to be a good thing. Now, the Labour Party was indeed dying before 2015. And the Corbyn project has, in fact, just speeded up its death. Um, it would have lingered on under a slightly more competent right-wing leader like, say, Andy Burnham. Um, but Corbyn, by giving it um, the, the life of 600,000 members, in the end, ended up speeding up its death. It's really dying now under Starmer, and it will not survive the Starmer government. It will disintegrate. Um, big, or the, it will disintegrate into, into various different component parts, and a significant chunk of it will merge with the Tories or something like that. Because there we are really approaching the end of it now. So in the end, to repeat what I uh, set out to say here, the results are positive because it's, ki it's killed it by giving the left exactly what it wanted. HM, who says, hello from Brighton. Stalin's dialectical and historical materialism is up next on my reading list. Well, that's a good one. Uh, there's no better place to start, actually, for um, unpacking dialectical and historical materialism and understanding the place of um, Hegel's system in Marx's system than uh, Stalin's work on that particular question. Um, Slava, good evening to you. Uh, Brad Wall, good evening. Uh, Isidore, hello to you. And President Jesus, uh, I hope you can hear me uh, because the microphone should be on and the microphone is recording sound. So if you can't hear me, then uh, let me know in the chat. Um, Cobra Commander says Arizona is enemy territory and apparently Albert's reading Capital Volume 2. That's a good one. Um... Where are we? Rianne, evening to you. Uh, I can guess what the weather is like in Wales because I'm in the northwest of England and it's about the same. Uh, Lurtis, good evening from mighty rain swept rush home. Well, not far away from me. Hello to you. Uh, yeah, I used to live just off a place in uh, rush home, just off Dickinson Road, if you're familiar with that, Lurtis. Uh, Otis, good evening to you. And good evening to Jenny and comrade. Hello, hi. Says, what are your opinions on the CPGBML? Well, I'm in it, so uh, I think you can tell that my, from that that my opinions will be somewhat favourable. You won't be getting a, an objective, perhaps uh, the objective evaluation from an outsider that you were looking for. If I fully answer your question. Uh, And who else we got here? Uh, Morgan says some, uh, the farmers are rebelling. The farmers are rebelling in Wales, which has been a long time coming. So the uh, the, the small to medium farmer revolt is growing. Uh, right. Jenny says we need a Marx militia. Always do. Uh, right. Where are we now? This is the problem with the, the YouTube chat. It like uh, spirals out of control sometimes in terms of scrolling down it. Uh, where are we?
There are a lot of conservatives who have significant class consciousness but bad theory. Uh, well, that's a fair point. Um, there's a lot of uh, social democrats who have decent class consciousness and appalling theory. So they're not alone there. Uh, hello to Fenrir. And Biden's dementia confirmed, says President Jesus. Is Kamala's alcoholism next? Well, um, you know what? They could just do a double confession this week and then it's... Uh, then it's your man, American Psycho Newsom, and presumably um, whatever uh, clone he gets out of a vat to serve as his vice president. Um, well, Comrade Hello High says there are no farmers anymore, just corporations who buy up land and employ labor. Well, not quite accurate in the British case. I mean, there are, there's a diminishing number of individual farmers who are like small to medium size sort of petty bourgeois types who employ a small amount of labor, but there's um, most of the land here is dominated by either uh, huge landowners or um, it's huge landowners working in partnership with agribusiness. Uh, right. So where are we now? Is Biden's dementia admission a distraction from the Putin interview? Well, if that's what they've got um, to, to wheel out to distract from the Putin interview, then that's pretty bad. I would suspect that, um, I mean, this uh, report from uh, this uh, special, invest, special counsel, her, um, essentially admits that Biden is suffering from dementia. I mean, I will read the, uh, the relevant page here that, um, that uh, is referred to. So... Let's, because uh, in um, in this report, uh, it refers frequently to Biden's biographer, a guy, uh, somebody called Zvonitsa. So um, I'm just going to read you the relevant parts here. Um, Mr. Biden's own words to Zvonitsa provide some support for this conclusion. In the recorded conversation, when Mr. Biden told Zvonitsa he had just found all the classified stuff downstairs. Mr. Biden's tone was remarkably casual. His sole reference to this discovery of classified documents was the brief aside. Mr. Biden did not sound surprised or concerned by the documents he referenced. While reasonable jurors could draw different conclusions from Mr. Biden's seeming nonchalance, one conclusion is that if Mr. Biden discovered classified documents, it simply was not significant to him and was something he could have quickly forgotten. After all, the Afghanistan documents and the 2009 troop surge played no role in Promise Me Dad, the book Mr. Biden wrote with Zvonitsa in early 2017. There is no reason to believe Mr. Biden intended to discuss the 2009 Afghanistan troop debate in his book, which, as he ex as explained in Chapter 5 of the report, covered his experiences of 2014 and 2015. In dozens of hours recorded conversations with Zvonitsa in 2016 and 2017, when Mr. Biden talked about a vast array of topics, the Afghanistan documents never came up. This may suggest that after February 16, 2017, the documents were simply not on Mr. Biden's mind. Mr. Biden's memory also appeared to have significant limitations, both at the time he spoke to Zvonitsa in 2017, as evidenced by their recorded conversations, and today as evidenced by his recorded interview with our office. Mr. Biden recorded conversations with Zvonitsa from 2017 are often painfully slow, with Mr. Biden struggling to remember events and straining at times to read and relay his own notebook entries. In his interview with our office, Mr. Biden's memory was worse. He did not remember when he was vice president, forgetting on the first day of the interview when his term ended. Quote, if it was 2013, when did I stop being vice president? and forgetting on the second day of his interview when his term began in 2009. Am I still vice president? He did not remember, even within several years, when his son Bo died, and his memory appeared hazy when describing the Afghanistan debate that was once so important to him. Among other things, he mistakenly said he had a real difference of opinion with General Carl Eikenberry, when in fact Eikenberry was an ally whom Biden had cited approvingly in his Thanksgiving memo to President Obama. In a case where the government must prove that Mr. Biden knew he had possession of the classified Afghanistan documents after the vice presidency and chose to keep those documents, knowing he was violating the law, we expect that at trial his attorneys would emphasize these limitations in his recall. We also expect many jurors to be struck by 
the place where the Afghanistan documents were ultimately found in Mr. Biden's Delaware home, in a badly damaged box in the garage, near a collapsed dog crate, a dog bed, a Zappos box, an empty bucket, a broken lamp wrapped with duct tape, potting soil and synthetic firewood. A reasonable juror could conclude that this is not where a person intentionally stores what he supposedly considers to be important documents critical to his legacy. Rather, it looks like a place a person stores classified documents he has forgotten about or is unaware of. We have considered and investigated the possibility that the box was intentionally placed in the garage to make it appear uh, there by accident, by mistake, sorry, but the evidence does not support that conclusion. Right, so uh, that rather elongated quote basically tells us that um, they aren't they aren't prosecuting Biden because basically the his lawyers would argue that he's an old man who doesn't remember anything. So essentially, what the uh, the just the official line of the um, of the special investigator, special counsel, uh, is that the president who is running for a second term can't remember his time as vice president, can't remember when that uh, term started, can't remember when his term finished, can't remember when his son died, can't remember uh, key details of discussions with his own biographer, and in the discussions with his biographer as far back as 2017, so that's seven years ago, doesn't re his mental state had deteriorated to the point where he couldn't recall details of just a few years before. Again, that's seven years ago. So I don't know whether this is the Democrats' way of essentially signaling that it's all over for Biden. I don't know. But it certainly seems to be a remarkable way of uh, trying to evade a potential prosecution, to essentially admit the truth that um, Democrats themselves were prepared to discuss in 2019, but shut up about in 2020. So it does rather raise the question, if the man who you're calling the president can't remember key details from previous decades and uh, can't remember key debates from when he was last in office, can't remember when his term started and finished, then who is exactly uh, in charge here? Then uh, who is making the decisions? It's not Biden, who can't remember anything. It's not day-drunk Kamala. So who's actually running the White House? Now, it's a reasonable question to ask in any administration. Certainly, presidents are not the important figures that they are um, presented to you as when you're learning about this in um, civics class, if you're American, or uh, international politics class at uh, A-level in Britain. But it does. It is a reasonable question to ask. Like, even if you assume that Obama was an actor, mainly appointed to secure the interests of Wall Street, he did at least play an active role in decision making. What active role is Biden playing? Who's making the decisions in the administration? Should be reasonable questions that would be asked, but I doubt that they will be answered. Right. Uh, Jenny says Labour Party is dead, and Jenny is correct. Just as Bernie exposed the Democrats and the whole fraudulent system. Yes, it's. Um, uh, very uh, correct um, point to make that Sanders inadvertently ended up exposing the Democratic Party for exactly what it has always been. He didn't mean to. And also exposing himself, just as Corbyn did, as uh, basically a supporter of imperialism, which both of the men always have been. Eduardo says, hello, comrades. A lot of leftists who say they're Marxists but not Leninists. Uh, and Slava replies, we are all Marxist, Leninist, Stalinists here. Classic term. Well, I think that the, I mean, to address both points here that Eduardo is making and that Slava is responding to, and this feeds into the um, the purpose of the live stream tonight, um, a lot of people will say they're Marxist because that we, we in Britain specifically and in the United States, are dealing with the very long hangover of the anti-communist uh, witch hunts and purges that, of course, took place throughout the period referred to as the Cold War. And, of course, the, uh, the addition to that of the role played by Trotskyism, which is, of course, deliberately promoted by the ruling class, and the absurd uh, speech given by Khrushchev in 1956, which, of course, was meant to destroy the legacy of Stalin, but also was, as uh, Roger Kieran and Thomas Kenny point out in their book, Socialism Betrayed, attacking Stalin is a veiled way of attacking Lenin. You seek to destroy one so you can get at the legacy of the other. And eventually that was done in the Gorbachev period. So 
because, of course, the the name of Stalin has been um, covered in mud uh, by the bourgeois in the West, those um, who are attracted to Marxism but still seeking respectability in bourgeois circles, especially academics, will often drop even the mention of Lenin's name because of the um, hysterical anti-communism that exists within leftist circles and has existed within leftist circles in America and Britain for a very long time now. It's only now you're nearly two generations away from the final collapse of the USSR that you're starting to see a re-evaluation uh, of Stalin's legacy. And part of that is down to the internet. I mean, the very fact that we can come together and discuss um, Stalin's legacy in forums like this shows the impact on a, in a positive way that having uh, access to the communication tools that modern capitalism has provided us uh, with is a positive thing. And the fact that you can now, unlike 30 years ago, now I can go online and actually access Russian materials that write about things such as the true legacy of socialism in the Baltic states, such as what actually happened with the um, in, with the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, as it is called. Uh, I can track down Russian sources on the Stalin period in the USSR and have them go through a an auto translate program to it so I can at least get an understanding of them like there's so many things that we uh, look at in our supposed history uh, that is taught to us at school college and university in Britain uh, that are of course just carefully curated lies the history of the Soviet Union being one of them the history of Marxism being another and since the collapse of most of the major Marxist-Leninist organizations that used to exist in Europe and the United States into various states of revisionism, then actually getting the reality from out of um, the fantasies and the lies about the Soviet period was a very, very hard thing to do back in the day. Now it's a lot easier, and we should be thankful for that. The capitalists have given us the rope, and let us make sure that we hang them with it. Um, right, okay. So where are we now? Okay. Wayne Tables says, thank you guys, I was aware. I mean, that is a reference to George Galloway spoke at CPGB events. I only asked the question because I was curious what is keeping him from being member of the CPGB. My assumption was it's a matter of fact. Okay, I've obviously missed a question there. What is your view on the career of George Galloway? Okay. I'm an American and don't know the minutia of British politics, but I'd be curious how British MLs perceive him. I can't help but admire him a great deal. Uh, well, you, any of you who have followed me for a while will know that I used to be a member of Galloway's party, the WPB, but I left it. Um, I'm going to take that question and put it into. I've now got an extensive Q and A session because if I answer that, it's going to be. I'm going to be here for a long time. So, what I'll do, Wayne, if it's all right with you, if you're able to email me that question to the address stated in the description box for the live stream, I'll answer it in the Q and A session that's coming up next week. Uh, right. Theory question of sorts. I'm going to read Hegel's Logic soon. What edition translation should I get? Um, the only one that was available to me in Britain was one that was um, published several years ago, like back in the 80s, I think. Um, it's, it's not an easy one to get into because the way that Hegel writes is rather odd. There's like chunks of text followed by like long thinner explanatory notes once you get into it it's fairly it's fairly good um I'll tell you what i'll post a picture on the telegram group of the edition that i've got and so you can have a look at it uh, leader of the free world can't remember well he wouldn't be the first would he uh stalin is the most lied about man ever very true jenny uh Right, Beiju, good evening to you. Luter92 says there was a big reevaluation of Stalin in Russia when Gorbachev failed. That's true. I, I think also there's a, there's a class division here um, within uh, the Soviet Union, uh, the ex-Soviet countries and Russia. Um, I think that the, um, the party elite, many of them, of course, were anti-Stalin, which is why 
Khrushchev comes about in the first place. But also, um, I think within the working class, the view on Stalin remains positive and to this day, because, of course, Stalin is routinely voted. I mean, this is rather unscientific, like either the second or the first uh, greatest historical figure in Russian history, either just above or just below Peter the Great. So the great masses of the working class in the Soviet nations still remembered Stalin um, as a great leader. It was the party elite that uh, wanted to bury him because, well, let us go back to uh, what's referred to as the Great Terror in rather melodramatic terms by Westerners or the purges of the later 1930s. Who were they actually targeted at? Mostly, mostly. Uh, there were, of course, incidents of like workers um, being arrested by the NKVD back then. But the, the, the bulk of the purges were of the party elite. They were of the leadership group. Uh, they were of the high-ranking generals in the military. That was what the, the military uh, plotters um, who were found out to be uh, conspiring with the Germans in the later 1930s. And again, it turns out that many of them were. There were all kinds of uh, conspiracies in the upper uh, echelons of the state, the party and the military, which were fortunately rooted out. And so... It makes a good deal of sense when you think about it this way, that the Stalin, as expressed through the 1936 Constitution, which is called the Stalin Constitution, but was in reality a collective endeavor, was, along with his comrades, such as people like Molotov and Kaganovich, they were serious about protecting and defending the dictatorship of the proletariat. And therefore, it's not a surprise that the people who have the fondest uh, regard for Stalin are the proletariat and their descendants. And those who wanted the, to see the back of Stalin and wanted his legacy buried are who? It's the party hierarchy. It's the people who were targeted by the purges. Now, is it the most effective method to stop the re-emergence of bourgeois tendencies to carry out um, purges of the party hierarchy? Well, you can argue about that. You can argue about whether the Cultural Revolution was an effective method. I would argue it had certain virtues to it and it had um, certain drawbacks to it, just as the methods used by the Soviet leadership in the 1930s were. But in both cases, I think what we can say is that the reaction of the party hierarchy, especially in the, um, in the Soviet Union, was so uh, dramatic in trying to carry through what was essentially a counter-revolution in 1956 and ultimately being stalled and then you have the, the, the sort of messy Brezhnev period in some respects in terms of it, the deadlock between uh, the revolutionary wing and the uh, revisionist wing. But there's no doubt that the, what motivated the Brezhnev, um, sorry, the Khrushchev group in 1956 was a wish to essentially end the revolutionary process, end the intensifying class struggle in the Soviet Union. And to do that, they had to bury Stalin, because that's what Stalin stood for. Stalin stood for the defense of the dictatorship of the proletariat and the continuation of the struggle against bourgeois tendencies. And that was what Stalin, um, Molotov, Kaganovich, Zhdanov, people like that, were all committed to. And it's what Khrushchev and his clique uh, at the top of the party wanted to bury. And that is you know, their primary sin. And in that moment, they essentially set in place a 30-year process, which ended with the destruction of socialism in 1989 to 91. Right. Okay, where are we? Comrade Hello Hi says, the CPGBML needs to do a poster campaign and become more of a presence in communities. Well, that's what we're doing this weekend, and we're doing it in Liverpool. Come see us. Um, Isidore says, hippies were a mixed bag. Real revolutionary tendency co-opted by bourgeois BS. Very intentional CIA op back then, back when the CIA were drunk but competent, unlike Kamala. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I tend to agree. I mean, like there was, like the 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 '60s rebellion thing um, in the West, particularly. I think 
there were some decent uh, instincts within those people who were a lot of whom came from like the upper working class and petty bourgeoisie but because it was unmoored from uh, class politics a lot of the time it got quite easy or e even if it was it was done in a sort of the contorted and CIA influenced uh, manner of the new left it got very easily sidelined and just pushed into harmless consumerism uh, commodified rebellion and those who were actual revolutionaries got disillusioned or dropped out because a lot of them were following either like various forms of like uh, ultra leftism trotskyism maoism which all emerged as a um, a a response to revisionism in the soviet union and elsewhere but ultimately led only to a sort of sectarian dead end again we can go into that in more detail uh a minor point, says Big Meanie, uh, but the special counsel who wrote the opinion on Biden's documents case was appointed by Trump. Dems say he has an agenda and can be ignored. I doubt he will be ignored. I mean, it, it's going to make news um, and it forces the issue of the fact that Biden um, has no brain back into the agenda again. Whether they'll dump him or not, I don't know, but it's certainly... It, I don't think that the uh, the verdict that he renders in those pages I read out is inaccurate. I think it is accurate. Um, and he didn't even need to make anything up. <laughs> of course, the Democratic Party has now, uh, and the Republicans too, have reached the point where they will literally present you with a corpse and tell you that it is dancing. Uh, so I wouldn't rule them. I wouldn't rule out them actually having the utter gall and shamelessness to present like the shuffling corpse of Biden and say he's a man in the prime of life. And for enough Democrats, um, party sort of petty bourgeois voters to say, well, it's better than Trump. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, where are we now? Ian Foster says, Country Joe was totally based, indeed. Uh, Wayne asks, was Stalin poisoned? Uh, I, I've heard theories about that, but um, I'm not sure whether the evidence is actually there to support it. If you look into um, Stalin's health prior to, um, prior to his, uh, his stroke, I mean, he it was reported that he was suffering from um, uh, headaches and um, other uh, problems that are associated with, uh, well, smoking for a long time. He'd given up smoking due to warnings from his doctor um, regarding like lung capacity and uh, various other smoking-related conditions. Um, he was into his 70s. He was a man with a very high-stress job and had been in his earlier years uh, something of a heavy drinker and a heavy smoker. Now, he thought he could go on forever because of the legendary Georgian longevity. Um, but if he did die with, from a stroke, then, or the effects of a stroke, then it wouldn't be out of the question, given the combination of age and stress and all the other things that you have to take into account. Now, that being said, I don't know that he wasn't poisoned and those who posit that point of view don't know that he was what you could say was that uh, there are allegations uh, and i think molotov repeats this that um beria and others had certain motivations to um, allow stalin to die and that's perhaps why medical treatment wasn't um, rushed to him as quickly as it should have been fundamentally we don't know unless we find um you know Beria's secret diary somewhere where he has it written down things to do in 1953 poison stalin stage coup restore capitalism then we're not going to know i mean molotov in his book comes close to making certain allegations about certain other members of the politburo but these are just his suspicions and to be fair to molotov he makes clear when he doesn't have evidence for something so we don't know basically there were people who certainly had motivation to kill him, the imperialists being the prime uh, prime candidates for that. But there were people in the Politburo who might not have complained, who certainly didn't complain that he died when he did. And there is that story that goes around repeatedly about uh, the fact that he was essentially 
uh, getting ready to launch another purge of the party hierarchy. That's that. But again, these are unconfirmed reports. I haven't read all of Molotov's um, uh, biography yet um, that he uh, told to his biographer Felix Chuev. So when I've read all of that book, perhaps there'll be more in there and I'll come back to you with more details. Uh, right. I always thought, thought American communists were better than many Trotskyists we have in Britain. Well, there's um, some American conservatives who are better than Trotskyists that we have in Britain. Uh, comrade, hello, hi. That's rather flippant, but the Trotskyists movement in Britain is an abysmal collection of petty bourgeois fools. And I should know because I was one for a while. Right. So we've gone on for rather a long time there with uh, Q&As, etc. But there's no problem with that. So to proceed on to the uh, meat of the issue, uh, which is the question of the necessity of theory. Um, now, I raise this because, of course, um, the famous quote from Lenin is that there, without revolutionary theory, there can be no revolutionary practice. And that's certainly true. Uh, not that you should spend your, um, all your time reading a book and theorizing, but the value of revolutionary theory is that, of course, uh, if, if learnt properly and understood properly and studied properly, it is, of course, a proper guide to action. And the need for it is, of course, uh, because of the nature of the bourgeois dictatorship uh, which we, in fact, live in. And that dictatorship is, of course, so all-encompassing and so um, thorough going in its application that uh, bourgeois ideology doesn't just take the form of the, uh, the political process which is presented to you on television as the uh, way in which that you should structure your beliefs. Are you a liberal? Are you a conservative? Do you, are you a Tory? Are you a Labour man? Etc. Etc. All of which is meant to push you down uh, these dead ends that are you know, constructed for you by the bourgeoisie at this stage. But the bourgeois ideology, of course, as um, someone like Parenti uh, chronicles in his work, goes much further than that. It, of course, because it arises out of the capitalist relations of production and is shaped by uh, the capitalist relations of production, it uh, informs every aspect of our lives. So not just in terms of um, the political choices, but cultural choices as well. Like the, the values of the ruling class are embedded within all of the cultural products that we consume or try to ignore, if uh, you're anything like me. Um, but they are, of course, even embedded within those particular um, cultural products, which are praised by leftists as like embodying some kind of hidden anti-capitalist critique. And um, this is uh, true of uh, the, the series of films that uh, came out like 20-odd uh, like years ago, uh, just in the period after the invasion of Iraq, that were purportedly uh, critical of the uh, the invasion of Iraq and were critical of the um, of the so-called neocons. And if you've been watching this program for a while, you'll know why I have problems with that term. But were in actual fact a series of films made by um, Hollywood liberals who were essentially paving the way for Barack Obama. Or you could, um, you know, try and read Resistance into a Marvel movie or a Star Wars product. All of these things are, of course, um, produced by capitalist entities. They are, of course, worked on by people who have completely uh, amended themselves and uh, amended themselves to um, the kind of corporate culture that exists inside uh, major entertainment studios. And therefore, it's very unlikely that they're smuggling in hidden anti-capitalist messages. And the other thing, of course, to bear in mind when looking at um, the corporate world, and of course, the, the corporate world of the entertainment industry, um, is that when you get like uh, various um, YouTube channels uh, that like are uh, funded by Ben Shapiro complaining over and over again about, you know, hidden Marxism in you know, Disney products or something like that. Um, what that, that's actually revealing is the fact that the um, the ruling class and bourgeois ideology is, in fact, very flexible and bourgeois ideology. Uh, can one of its great strengths is that it can incorporate certain aspects 
of previous generations of revolt and then repackage them and sell them to you in harmless ways. So someone mentioned in the chat just a minute ago the fact that um, uh, hippiedom was um, co-opted and then sold back to uh, people as a consumer product. There's a line in uh, the famous uh, British movie um, With Nail and I where the drug dealer character says at the end, they're selling hippie wigs in Woolworths since the end of the 60s. Uh, it's, it's a good throwaway line at the end of the film, but of course it does reveal a certain truth, which is, of course, capitalism in the, the period of consumer capitalism that we're still in, but with uh, certain developing problems around it, had the ability to, uh, re to take the skin of anything and wear it. Um, as long as it had been the... All radical content had been stripped out of it. So as long as um, you know, communism re was reduced to a star and a hammer and sickle, it could be put on a T-shirt. As long as Che Guevara was trapped in the T-shirt, nobody was studying what he wrote. Um, all of this can be, of course, um, again, stripped of its content and sold back to you. And or uh, put in a... A movie of some kind which then uh, people on the left and people on the right online will then argue about at great length on YouTube channels and will give you the illusion that any of this is in some way outside of the the bounds of bourgeois ideology none of it is of course so when bourgeois ideology is all-encompassing as I said it's not just about politics it's about every single aspects of life that is presented to you every form of um, history every form of uh, knowledge that is presented to us is conditioned by bourgeois ideology uh, the science and the scientific process is conditioned by bourgeois ideology because of course who funds the scientific studies who pays for the research who decides what research gets published who gets to the top of um, scientific and research organizations all of these are conditioned by the needs of the bourgeois class so when you're talking about uh, the need for revolutionary theory for a start you need revolutionary theory to have a thorough understanding of the fact that all of these institutions are conditioned by bourgeois relations of production and therefore by also bourgeois ideology and to have a full and proper understanding of that, one needs to actually have studied um, a lot of aspects of uh, Marxism and, of course, the lessons left to us by Lenin, Stalin, Mao, etc. And uh, later on, uh, people like uh, Parenti in his studies of the culture industry, people like Gramsci on the role of the intellectuals. And yes, if you're going to be a communist in, at any time period, but especially now, you need to spend uh, quite a lot of your spare time reading and you need to be able to uh, translate that theory into practice of course but there will there are people out there on, a, on in the online world and in the real world who will of course tell you that uh, all this reading of marxism is nonsense and that what's needed is um so-called uh populism or common sense socialism whatever that is uh, or uh, that the working class is scared of Marxism it's scared of revolutionary theory that the the right wingers have uh, polluted the name of Stalin far too far and that we need to essentially take people from where take people where they are don't give them concepts that could scare them or make them run away and of course this is essentially the same argument that was put forward many many years ago and that Lenin comprehensively demolished in uh, what is to be done but to deal with the idea that of course you don't need a revolutionary theory uh, it's not just to understand the thoroughgoing nature of bourgeois dictatorship it's also to by reading revolutionary theory and understanding it and discussing it with comrades and developing it further we can understand how the class dynamics play out of course if you studied dialectical and historical materialism then you stand a better chance of actually understanding how uh, different struggles play out why the situations uh, that hit us every day are as they are and if you don't have that if you don't understand where particular struggles come from and why they have shaped up in that way then you stand no chance of understanding where they are going and you're also just going to be bounced between uh, different forms of um, again either bourgeois ideology or sort of petty bourgeois break-offs from that because these are the dominant forms of ideological expression in our society um, the way in which the um, uh, the current um, revolts are carrying on we've had this discussion 
before just to, to go back to the farmers uh, movement in the uh, in, in Germany and in Spain and elsewhere about what is uh, fueling uh, right wing populism and of course we've discussed that it's the um, the petty bourgeois coming under more and more pressure from a system which is of course relentlessly monopolizing and pressing down on them now and therefore they are engaged in something of a revolt and this is partially what fueled Brexit, what fueled Trump etc. Because that petty bourgeois tendency is they are the ones um, also with the uh, with the smaller bourgeois the, these are the ones who have um, a degree of uh, capital behind them even if it's quite small they are able to uh, mobilize themselves in significant numbers at the moment whereas the organized working classes are sort of starting to do that but doesn't isn't uh, quite as dramatic as the mobilizations of the farmers so what you're getting at the moment is of course revolts of the petty bourgeoisie uh, taking place in a lot of countries now it's important to understand those properly because and not need doing the the, the knee-jerk fashion that leftists do which is just condemn them and say oh these people are all heinous right-wingers therefore we don't need to take them seriously or go down the other route of um, just accommodating yourself endlessly to uh, ideologies expressed by the petty bourgeoisie which are the um, the the same now or they are set they are formed in the same way as they were when Marx was uh, critiquing various forms of petty bourgeois socialism um, and this um, was the, um, the, the the critique Marx posed in the uh, Communist Manifesto was because that was that took, took the form of him explaining um, how the petty bourgeois as a class are formed and reformed um, sandwiched between capital and labor therefore have a tendency towards uh, both envy and hatred of the bourgeoisie and of course hatred and fear of the proletariat and uh, depending upon which class is stronger the petty bourgeoisie will ultimately join with them either they'll join with the bourgeois in the form of um, fascist reaction or they'll join with the proletariat because they they can put together some kind of common program with them now the problem that we have at the moment and this is especially true in the online spaces um, is that because you have these dramatic looking uh, petty bourgeois led uh, protest movements in the form of the farmers movements and you have these uh, petty bourgeois figures making waves in uh, the uh, the space of capitalist politics be it Trump be it uh, the figures like Farage in Britain um, or characters like Le Pen in um, in France or the AFD in Germany because they are seen to be um, figures that are on the rise you get a lot of people uh, especially those who um, associate themselves with like multipolar theories, opportunistically jumping on these petty bourgeois tendencies and trying to adapt themselves to them. And this is true of like some people who start off from the leftist perspective. I had one particularly stupid individual a while ago arguing that a vote for Marine Le Pen was a uh, the better vote for anti-imperialism. Now, admittedly, there wasn't a great deal of choice in that French election, but no vote at all was superior to a vote for either Macron or Le Pen, given that they, even by the even by stu studies conducted by French bourgeois academics, the programs of Macron and Le Pen have effectively dovetailed with each other. So, there is, of course, now as this is the point that I'm making, because these petty bourgeois forces are making a great deal of waves. You can see a lot of these internet commentators like moving towards them. Like this is the evolution of like people like Russell Brand, who I have spelled out my opinions about in unfavorable terms before, but also like people like Jimmy Dore, who's like started off as sort of a a sort of leftist Bernie guy and now is like sort of sliding more and more towards like um, a sort of pro-Trump position um, because essentially like that's where some say it's just where the money is but I, I see it slightly differently that's where the sort of a lot of political momentum is at the moment within the it's within like uh, the the oppositional trend in the United States is being partially defined by the uh, petty bourgeoisie and the lower bourgeoisie 
uh, of the United States um, because that's what's happening there. You get a lot of people like flocking towards that in an opportunistic fashion. And until, of course, the American proletariat is able to actually express itself as a class, um, then what you're going to get is a bunch of confused nonsense. And the energy of the lower bourgeoisie and the, uh, the petty bourgeoisie in the terms of their oppositions can either be captured, as I've said before, by either a better organized proletariat or by a faction of the bourgeois who decide that it's time to uh, fundamentally change things inside the United States to restore profitability. And of course, in the lower bourgeois, but particularly in the mass ranks of the pressurized and often ruined petty bourgeoisie, you have, of course, the people who are traditionally the mass ranks of fascism. So in, in contradistinction to the leftists who believe that we're already in fascism, uh, we have like potential um, fascist material in the form of uh, an increasingly um, economically uh, disadvantaged in comparison to their previous status, petty bourgeoisie, a pressurized petty bourgeoisie, who stand a chance of being ruined when the, uh, the recession really kicks in, um, becomes more than the, the long depression that it is and essentially goes down into another level of recession. Uh, inside the United States or in Britain or in Western Europe, then you stand the, the chance of seeing two things. One is that the proletariat en masse will have to stage some kind of fight back, and the other is that, of course, if the proletariat doesn't manage to pull along significant sections of the petty bourgeois with it, then these petty bourgeois will, of course, some of them at least, be fertile recruiting ground for fascists. They have been in the past, they will be again. So this comes back to, of course, the necessity of theory. And the necessity of theory enables you to interrogate um, movements such as, again, farmers' movement, the, the Trump movement, the Brexit phenomenon, the Le Pen phenomenon, interrogate them properly for what they actually represent and be able to discern uh, with the difference between something which is an actual fascist movement, which I would argue Le Pen's movement still is, uh, or and then you get the various things that the fascists try to glom onto and try to um, uh, try to take advantage of. So, like Le Pen tried to associate herself with the Yellow Vest movement, which kind of failed because the Yellow Vest leadership, such as it was, rejected all conventional politicians. The fascists also try and jump on the farmers' movement, even though the fascists are, of course, the foot soldiers ultimately of the monopolies. They always try to play the card of, oh, we're on the side of the bold, independent, small trader, small farmer, etc. It doesn't matter that they're the foot soldiers of monopoly capital. They don't certainly don't come as that in terms of their advertising. So you need to be able to interrogate the differences between all of these things and see and come back to fundamental principles when making political decisions, which is that it's and when, in, when orienting yourself um, around or towards, should we say, uh, these petty bourgeois movements when in interacting with them one needs to uh, represent um, the uh, represent thoroughly a proletarian ideology to them one that can of course um, accommodate certain of um, their interests in terms of reaching a common program of action or pulling uh, pulling together a broad front between uh, the proletariat and the um, certain sections of the petty bourgeoisie but you don't get the allegiance of these people just by pandering to them. And you certainly don't, aren't able to mobilize the proletariat in significant um, uh, strength by pandering to the petty bourgeoisie. No, you mobilize the proletariat by having um, proletarian ideology at the heart of your organization, by sinking roots into the proletariat and mobilizing with the proletariat, but also, again, not tail ending the proletariat again as lenin said that the uh, the the revolutionary party's job is to uh, implant the revolutionary consciousness within the proletarian masses but and then where, as the strength of the proletariat increases you stand a better ch chance of actually reaching an accommodation with certain sections of the petty bourgeois who will become convinced uh, of the proletariat's destiny to become the ruling class and see a way for national renewal and therefore a space for them in a potential new society. None of this is done 
by simply tail-ending petty bourgeois tendencies, saying bollocks to theory, bollocks to Marxism, and thinking that you can basically, by pandering to what to the petty bourgeois one minute and then pandering to like certain elements within the proletariat the another at another moment that you can reach some kind of uh, so-called um accommodation and this is uh, also why i reject this um uh, you left and right unite idea and the way of expressing it this is an incorrect formulation what you should be emphasizing is of course the um we need to, first of all, unify as many different layers of the proletariat as possible into a unified proletarian movement. That's the first priority. This left and right unite stuff is accepting of uh, bourgeois terminology. It's basically saying that there can be an accommodation between what um, proletarian forces and reactionary forces. No, you need to, once you have unified, once you once the proletariat has activated itself and has in, gone into action against the capitalist class and has become more and more and more layers of the proletariat have become unified together in a single movement against the capitalist class at that point other classes such as the petty bourgeoisie will be pulled into the movement elements that who have been lumpenized will be pulled into that movement through the strength of the proletariat putting it in terms of left and right unite is nonsense because those are fundamentally those are bourgeois terms for a failing bourgeois political system that the proletariat rightly in, in by the millions reject and despise what communists should be putting forward indeed must put forward is this first of all unite the proletariat around a um, a, a program of action and then move uh, and then the proletariat will start to move in action against the bourgeoisie and then can be um come the revolutionary force that it has to be but only of course if there is a communist party there capable of actually providing that leadership so this left and right unite stuff is again this is opportunism this is like um petty bourgeois leftist stuff this is pandering and it has to be critiqued and it has to be ultimately rejected and it has to be shown why it's nonsense because like you you can't unite with forces that are from the, the ultimately from the bourgeois you can't unite with bourgeois ideology like you need to show up bourgeois ideology for what it is critique it and show to the proletariat why it has to be rejected you don't get anywhere by repeating its mythology by repeating its claims no matter how clever you think you're being right um here we go so uh, uh, right all right where are we we seem to be in the middle of reflections on various different things. All right, where are we now? Ah, founders. Uh, PC USA uh, talks a good game, but is very marginal, um, says Martin. Yes, I have looked at a couple of their things. I uh, don't. Uh, I'm not too familiar with them, but I, I have I have read some of their theoretical work. It is quite interesting, um, so I'll uh, I'll go back to that. I may um, I may get somebody on the uh, program uh, from that organisation um, in the near future, uh, so that we can actually have a decent conversation about that. So. Um, here we go. So, Otis says, I definitely consider myself to be a Stalinist. Uh, we used to affectionately call the great man Uncle Joe, and when I was younger, Reg Birch used to tell me just how great Uncle Joe was. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't use it personally because I, I read an interview with Stalin where he rejected the term. I can see why other people use it, though. I mean, Stalin always called himself just a loyal student of Lenin. So that's why I, I don't use it. Um, so I can see why people do, though. I don't think it's something to you know, debate about. Uh, whether there is like a specific um, 
a thought, school of thought that you could specifically call Stalinism. I mean, as I said, Stalin always insisted he was just applying the lessons that Lenin left to him. But then again, Stalin was a humble man. So I don't know. I'm not opposed to the term, but I just choose not to use it myself. Uh, Carlson Putin interview released will be a fun listen in the morning. Well, I'm oh just on the Carlson Putin interview. Uh, I'm going to watch it uh, first thing in the morning. I may watch it after this stream has done, actually. And then I'm probably going to do a, a special um, stream on it. Um, probably going to be 2 p.m. tomorrow. So tune in for that. Uh, apparently, the interview is up on uh, Carlson's site already. Okay, apparently Jenny's flicking between me and Putin. Well, good company there. Uh, right, where are we? Just remember when Nancy Hammertime Pelosi said stopping the genocide in Palestine is Putin's plan. If only it was. Maybe Putin has a plan. I don't. I. I don't think so. With that, with regard to that, however. Uh, Apparently, Putin is giving Carlson a history lesson. Well, Putin does love his history, but then again, there's plenty of the history that Putin gives, which I don't think is accurate. Uh, uh, flocking Is flocking towards Trump momentum only opportunist, or should we be trying to catch that momentum co opted ourselves? How do we approach that correctly? Um... This is an interesting question, Isidore. Um, and it relates back to what I was saying about the farmers' movement. It's like it's not that we just basically need to stand on the side of these things and say, hey, that's shit and right wing. Um, it's that you need to approach it with, with like a critical, um, critically engage with it, I think is the right way to put it. Like a lot of people like at Trump rallies want, um, from what I've seen, uh, some of them at least, want reindustrialization of the United States. They want, um, you know, infra infrastructure investment. They want their cities to be clean and decent. All laudable objectives. Yes, they often express it in ways that are confused and reactionary because, of course, their bourgeois and uh, bourgeois ideology is all they've ever really been exposed to. But there's no reason why these people can't be won over. What I'm saying is, is there's a difference between approaching them and engaging with them and saying okay well we agree on you with you on this and this but here's where we differ from you and trusting that most workers if you're approaching workers or indeed some petty bourgeois are going to be intelligent enough to be able to discern that well maybe there's questions to be raised here maybe there's something to be engaged with here um, and not just going up to them and saying hey we agree with you but we'd do it better or just agreeing with them and um, not raising questions and not raising difficult points with them. I'm not saying go and start haranguing people. I'm saying, like, go and have a conversation. Go and have a discussion about what they're in favor of, what they think communism is, why they're anti-communist, these kind of questions. An opportunist goes along to, like, a Trump rally and just cheers along and, and then, you know, presumably goes and make a TikTok about it. A communist will go and engage with workers, even if these workers are um, expressing themselves via the sort of reactionary bourgeois ideology that they, they, they are immersed in, that we are all immersed in, uh, but are expressing class demands in a distorted way. Go and converse with them and engage with them and try and point out some points where, that they, that, where some of their demands are correct, but their ways of pursuing them won't lead them to what they're after. So, again, it's the difference between engaging with something and just tail-ending something is the point I'm trying to make here. If you want me to elaborate more on that, I'm happy to do so in the future. Uh, right. 13 minutes in and Putin's all made it to 1939 and he's shitting on Poland. <laughs> um, oh, God. Lertis says, Farmers' movement in France is divided along syndical lines, one of which is more left-leaning and class-aware. Most of it, though, is fully co-opted by the Macron government in their drive to more liberalism. That's interesting. Um, I, I hadn't read about it being co-opted by the Macron government. I mean, I know that some of it is sympathetic towards Le Pen, 
But I mean, from what I could see, it was hostile to Macron, uh, given that he's been in office for quite some time and is the man who owns this policy they're protesting against. But if that's the case, uh, then I, well, I need to dive further into this. Um, I know there's a stronger, uh, strong minority in the farmers movement that's more pro worker and to the left. But clearly, if this is if what you're saying is correct, I need to read more, more, more about uh, what is going on there. I haven't researched it in depth yet. So with regard to your comment, Lurtis, I will go and look more into this to see uh, what is actually going on. Dallas Ken points out that necessity was spelt wrong in the title of this episode. Well, I have taken your criticism and the mistake has been corrected. That's what you get when you set up this um, the live stream on your phone. Um, what's your take on people like Hinkle, who basically says he is a Marxist-Leninist Stalinist and to a point successfully tries to appeal to Trump supporters with regard to left and right unite? Um, I'm going to avoid giving too many judgments on Jackson Hinkle because I've like I've watched like two of his videos. Um, I I find like some of the way he approaches things to be um, opportunist. But what I will say to K667's point is um, what I will do, I'll commit to doing, is watching more of his stuff. And then when I've watched it, I will comment more correctly on it. Just like with the um, the mega communism thing. Like, I read um, the InfraHaz post on his Substack a long time ago. I haven't reflected further further on it um, since then. I had my issues with it when I read it. So as with the has thing, I need to watch more of what Hinkle has said recently to see where I agree and disagree. So again, like if you want me to go into more depth on that question in the Q&A, email it to the address I've provided and I'll add it to the Q&A list. Interesting exchange on Midwest and Marx recently, says uh, Fish Biscuits, where CPUSA guy says they are reactionary, Eurocentric and pandering because they are trying to reach out to maggots and deplorables. I, yeah, uh, uh, that Noah guy has more patience than I did. That CPUSA guy was fucking unbearable. Uh, I mean, CPUSA, um, to my mind, yeah, I, I don't know why anybody bothers with it. It's a organization which seems to me to be completely run by people who just act as essentially a codpiece for the Democrats. Like it's as dead as the Communist Party of Britain is in these in, in this country, which just acts as like a, again a codpiece for the Labour Party. So these are dead organizations. I mean, like I, I mean Midwestern Marx. Like I I've watched a fair bit of this stuff. I've interviewed. Uh, Carlos Garrido a couple of times I've read his work I respect for the man's intellect and his output I have some disagreements with their theoretical perspectives but they are um, a, a lot of their stuff is about trying to dispel like um, bourgeois propaganda on actually existing socialist countries on China um, that to call them Eurocentric is like ridiculous it's just like the kind of like petty little insults that like ultra leftists and opportunists throw around so Credit to Noah for debating that guy. Like, I wouldn't have had the patience, to be honest. The guy was a moron. Um, uh, Eduardo says, around a vanguard CPGBML. That is correct. Don't be a panda bear, says Jenny. Correct. Um, Comrade Hello High says, thoughts on ICMPLO and ICOR. Have you tried joining them? No. ICMPLO is the international organization that it describes itself as, as Hojerist, uh, I think, uh, if I remember that correctly. And Hojerism is something uh, I, whereas I respect the revolutionary legacy of Hoja in Albania and a lot of what was achieved there in the revolutionary period, like Hoja ended up going down a, an ultra left route which in the end did more damage than good. Same with the um, same with uh, with how the um, Cultural Revolution ended up going um, in uh, in China. Like the 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 Senior Soviet split, though it was started and of course deserves to be laid at Khrushchev's door, was made worse by the ultra leftism of the later um, uh, CPC 
and um, the Albanians as well, uh, especially Hoxha. And like he's, I mean, I've read um, a lot of Hoxha's work, and like the later on he got, the more bizarre like his theories got. Like the 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 take he had on like um, Ch and like a Prague sixty eight was ridiculous. And like the, and by the time of the eighties, I mean earlier than that actually, he was calling that he say he and the the Maoist was saying that the Soviet Union was social imperialist and even fascist at, at different stages. I mean, it's completely ridiculous. Had no actual analysis behind it whatsoever. It was just hyperbole. And so, no, I mean, I wouldn't join ICM, PLO. ICOR, I've done less reading on, but no, I, I, I would not try and join either of those organizations. I think they're both dead ends. Uh... Few people in Sweden talk of themselves as of the proletariat. No one wants to be a loser. Well, that's an interesting point. I mean, I, I've i never been to Sweden, Dan. Uh, you're a native of Sweden, so I'll take your word for that. In Britain, it's a bit of a curious... Um, it's a curious one because you've got a lot of people who want to be um, petty bourgeois, but a lot of people want to claim they came from the working class. So it's a bit of a strange mixture here. I hope Putin has a plan, says Jenny. Uh, some of that bad history was included. Slava says, Putin history lessons usually come with a d dash of national chauvinism. I doubt this one would be any different. Um, yeah, I mean, Slava's right. I mean, Putin's history, um, sometimes he makes a correct point. Oftentimes, though, like, it's... His version of history is like a sort of an amalgam of um, various different forms of Russian nationalism, um, which often sits in a rather uncomfortable mess. Um, I'll dive into it when I've watched the full thing, but I've watched his speeches. I mean, his stuff on Ukraine, I find to be um, dubious, very dubious. I mean, the... The correct point to make, I think, on Ukraine is that not that Russians and Ukrainians are exactly the same, is that they are, of course, a, a, a people who are deeply interrelated to each other, obviously, given that um, they all, uh, that the uh, the origins of modern Russia with the Kievan Rus, or one of the origins of modern Russia with the Kievan Rus. But when uh, Putin starts claiming that, like, it's always been Russian and there's never been differences there, well, that's not true, and it's fairly easy to establish that it's not true. Um, there's, you know, been differences there between Russians and Ukrainians for many hundreds of years. Uh, it's what wars were fought over in like the 18th and um, 19th century. Um, and he's claimed that uh, that Lenin invented Ukraine basically out of whole cloth. That also isn't true, uh, because again, like there's a there was a re I said this before, but I will. Re if Putin keeps repeating bad history, I'll repeat the correct history, which is that. There was that Lenin didn't invent Ukraine out of nothing. Of course, there was a um, Ukrainian history there that uh, goes back a long way. And uh, there was a Ukrainian revolution and a Ukrainian revolutionary process that was started by Ukrainian communists who rose up against the Petluro Comprador regime that was run by um, the Kaiserist Germany. The, yes, that uh, uprising was crushed, but of course a lot of Ukrainian communists joined forces with the uh, the Red Army to rid um, a large part of what is now Ukraine of um, Petlura and Makno the bandit, who the anarchists love so much, and the White Armies. So there was a revolutionary process in Ukraine carried out by Ukrainian communists is the reason why, of course, um, you got the part of the reason anyway you got that soviet nationality policy which recognized ukraine as um and in as part of the soviet union as a as a republic because again it had that history it wasn't just done because lenin hated russia which is what the russian nationalists claim it was done to recognize the it was recognition of the fact that um great russian chauvinism under the tsardom really was a thing like the tsardom did try to stamp out different traditions in Russia. The Tsardom did um, basically in, um, discriminate against different religions, against different languages. So Putin sits rather uneasily when he makes these points, because on the one hand, he's adopting the point of view of like the, the deposed uh, Tsardom and the anti-communists 
in Russia um, that reemerged or were allowed, that grew up actually in the Brezhnev period, which is, of course, where Putin uh, got his start. Um, and the, um, the fact that they uh, were, uh, came, came back and started making these elaborate points about, you know, that uh, Russia was a victim of communism and all that kind of shit, which Putin sort of adopts but then sort of backs away from. And, but his adoption of some points um, of the sort of great Russian mentality, of the old great Russian chauvinist mentality, sits very uneasily with the fact that he has inside Russia largely stuck with the old Soviet nationality policy with regard to respect for uh, different languages, cultures and religions. So like, on the one hand, he's adopting bits of this old Russian chauvinist mythology. On the other hand, he but, but the official policy of the Russian government is that they still largely stick by the Soviet era nationality policy within Russia. He's just sort of adopt, adapted that around his idea of um, replacing essentially the Soviet identity with this Russian one. And again, this is why ultimately the Putin experiment is transitional. The Putin system is transitional and it will either go in one of two directions. It will either go towards a new version of uh, socialism or it will go in a more reactionary direction. At the moment, it's not clear where that's going to end up. But both tendencies are within the Putin system, and we'd be foolish to deny the contradictions that exist within it. Hello, comrade. Do you what Purity Fetish is? Well, it's a book by uh, Carlos Garrido, I believe. Uh, well, uh, but it's a book. It's the title of his book. Um, uh, Jenny says, like when Haz went to the MAGA rally, that's how he approached them. They agree with us when they don't know it's communism. Well, I've got things to say on that, but I'm going to wait until I, I comment properly. Uh, Reddit communists freak me out sometimes, says Battle Cossack. Well, that's true. Taylorism is cringe, says Jenny. That's true. Uh, don't go to our communism. I found some useful um, stuff on there, but I mean, like all of Reddit, it's like immersed in shit. Uh, yeah, here we go. Brian Becker profits from the protests. Yes, Brian Becker has his own particular, uh, his own particular way of uh, managing to surf the surf the wave right back to the Democrats again. Um, Isidore says, in France, the working class has a revolutionary consciousness. Okay. Uh, which still stands today. But a lot of it is anarchist or in other ways lacking in proper theoretical direction. It got ML for a short period when all, then all the intellectuals suddenly went anti-Stalin. Yeah, I mean, there's a militant tradition in the French working class. You're right about that. Uh, but again, like as you say, Isidore, in your contribution there, um, they've not really recovered from the period where like the both the French Communist Party and the intellectual sphere both were essentially anti-communist. The communist leadership became anti-communist, ultimately became Euro-communist and betrayed the masses. The intellectuals, of course, all took the uh, the anti-communist line and ended up um, essentially uh, becoming postmodernists. So, yeah, a Marxism-Leninism needs to be uh, thoroughly re-established everywhere. Uh, I mean, Putin is doing a balancing act, apparently. He always is. Putin's works and speeches reflect the various divisions within the Putin system. It's never just, he's not just making this up off the top of his head. It's always, all of his stuff, everything he says, everything he does, is designed to essentially keep all the different factions within the Bonapartist system that he runs, or is at the center of, um, on board. That's why, of course, um, he almost blew the early stages of the special military operation. But more on that tomorrow. Dan Lindstrom says, Working class is one thing, but the proletariat is something in Sweden historically that is extremely uh, poor uh, workers, homeless, and so on. Okay. Uh, well, I again, I don't know the Swedish situation, but... Um, if, uh, uh, if proletariat has come to basically mean 
um, lumpen in Sweden, then somebody's made a serious uh, theoretical mistake at some point in terms of usage of terms. That would be my opinion on that. I don't know the Swedish situation. So again, this is something I would need to read more on. Uh, people are proletarian whether they like it or not. Isidore's point is correct. Um, you, if you have to, if the only thing you have to live off is the sale of your labour, then you're a proletarian. Doesn't matter what opinion about yourself you actually have. Uh, New York Times just published an opinion piece in defence of Biden's memory, supplying Dem stalwarts with talking points. Uh, just saying, I try not to underestimate uh, the Dem talent for denial. Um, that's Big Meanie's point, and Big Meanie is correct. Do you think Putin hunts with the hounds or runs with the fox? Asked Otis. Um, that's an interesting question, um, but I, I will confess I do not fully understand. Um, pl uh, if you want me to answer that, explain it further. Right. Uh, okay. So I think this brings us to the end of this uh, freewheeling live stream for this evening. Uh, thank you to everybody who's tuned in. The uh, the audio for this will be up on the Patreon site tomorrow. So um, I will be doing a special program at 2 p.m. tomorrow on the the Putin Carlson interview. Uh, I anticipate that one will run and run. Uh, thank you to everybody who's tuned in and contributed to, again, a very active and very useful discussion this evening. And I will be back with you again tomorrow. Oh, Stalin was a mighty man, and a mighty man was he. He led the Soviet people on the road to victory. All through the revolution, he fought at Lenin's side, and they made a combination till the day that Lenin died. He said, come all you people, we must work with brain and hand. And then one day the Nazis came into the Soviet land. They plundered to the Volga, to Stalingrad, and then Joe Stalin said, come on me boys, and kick them out again. Oh, Stalin was a southerner, in Georgia he was born. Where the oranges grow thick and fast, and fields of waving corn. And Stalin is a farmer, his fingers they are green. And he has planted the biggest crop the world has ever seen. One day he looked upon the map and frowned and shook his head. There's too much brown and not enough green, these were the words he said. We'll have to change the weather, boys, he said. And then he smiled, so let's begin by planting trees along 3,000 miles. So Stalin rolled his sleeves up then and said it's time to start. The Volga River and the Don, they are too far apart. I think we'd better join them, so come and help me, pal, and we'll build a mighty waterway, the Volga Don Canal. Then Stalin went into the north, and there's saw rivers three, all emptying their waters into the polar sea. Now that's not right, Joe Stalin said, these rivers, they are ours. We'll turn them round and make them work and make electric power. There was a range of mountains that were standing in the way. So Stalin put his hand out and smoothed them all away. For Joe, he is determined to make the land all green, and that's the biggest project that the world has ever seen. Oh, Stalin is a mighty man, and he has a mighty plan. He's harnessed nature to the plow to work for the good of man. He's hammered out the future, the fortune he has seen, and he's made the worker state the best the world has ever seen.